Hi, my name is Aslan and I'm the CTO co-founder of DeepRender. Today we'll be talking about AI-based compression. The aim here is to uh, give you a primer on AI-based compression and demystify AI-based compression for the wider codec community. Uh, a quick note, when I say AI-based compression, I'm not speaking about adding post-processing modules to traditional codecs, or I'm not speaking about enhancing encoding commands or settings using machine learning. What we're going to be speaking about is entirely sidestepping the existing traditional codec paradigm of DCT macro blocking into an interblocks and redefining the rate distortion trade-off with machine learning primitives. Uh, a bit about DeepRender, we've been building AI-based codecs for the last five years, and we've just released a codec that can cut bandwidth costs by 5x. So we're um, uniquely qualified to speak about this matter. Jumping into what we'll speak about today, uh, AI and machine learning have been around, and I'll use AI, machine learning, and deep learning interchangeably. They've been around since the 50s and 60s. They've had their ups and downs. The most recent inflection point was around 2012 when uh, deep learning got extremely good at classification and segmentation. And then towards 2017, 2018, we got better and better at image generation. And all of machine learning essentially focuses on three main paradigms, which are uh, the architecture, the loss function, and the training. Um, we have to get these right in order to create something uh, valuable. Uh, we'll also touch a bit on production, hardware, features, and samples uh, during this conversation. Uh, architecture essentially is how we configure the neural network layers, the order we use, and uh, the set of machine learning primitives we use. We have a wide selection to choose from. The loss, fu loss function essentially determines uh, what we want our architecture to learn, so what we want the outcome of this to be. And training is how you set the system up and train on a set of videos and images. So jumping a bit into the architecture to start with, what you can see in front of you is what an AI-based codec architecture looks like. Uh, what we have is, uh, as input is an image, which goes through an encoder, and it produces a, a bitstream. We'll refer to the bitstream as a file. The bitstream then goes into the decoder and out comes the image that you want to reconstruct or send. The file is what's sent over the channel. Now the encoder and decoder here have the same meaning in a traditional sense of an encoder and decoder of say H.264 or any other traditional codec. But rather than the encoder having a DCT transform and blocking and uh, interblock modes, uh, we replace those with machine learning primitives such as a convolution, uh, a ReLU, or, or an attention layer. A key thing to note uh, is that machine learning primitives have learnable parameters. And learnable parameters are essentially free-floating numerical values which we can change. And during our learning process or um, optimizing our architecture process, we essentially change these learnable parameters using an algorithm called backpropagation. Let's speak a bit about the objective function. And now that we have our architecture configured, we want it to do something. And what we want it to do is defined by our objective function. And we should define our objective function in a way such that after our training process, our architecture satisfy our ultimate goal. And the ultimate goal for compression is the rate distortion trade-off. So we have to define rate and we have to define our distortion. Rate stands here for file size. This distortion here stands for uh, image degra degradation or image quality. A key thing to note here is that we must define rate and distortion in a differentiable way. And they need to be differentiable because I need to be able to say how changing those free-floating learnable parameters in my architecture will change my loss function. So if I can understand how changing the parameters change the loss function, I can slowly start to guide the parameters in a way such that they satisfy, they eventually satisfy my loss function. Algorithm that we use to use the, uh, do this is called backpropagation. And for it to work, we need our objective to be differentiable. If we focus first on the rate aspect of our objective function, we can define rate through Shannon entropy. Shannon entropy gives us 
the minimum number of bits required to encode some set of symbols. And it's defined by the negative log of P of X, which is the probability distribution over the symbols that you're trying to encode. For our case, X, the thing that we need to encode is an image or some representation of an image. And images are complex, multidimensional structures. And we don't really know the probability distribution of over a set of images. And it's actually practically impossible to do this. And all the machine learning is dedicated to trying to figure out the probability distribution over a natural set of images. So is um, compression and therefore so is deep render. So what can we do? There's a topic in machine learning that's dedicated to this, which is called variational inference. So if you can't compute this probability distribution, you can try to model it or estimate it in some way. And one way you can estimate it is assuming that this is your complex, this white distribution is your complex a distribution of your image or your set of images. You can create a far simpler distribution, say a normal distribution, which you understand, you can manipulate, you can evaluate, and you can sample from. And you can try to force this green simple distribution to be closer to this complex white distribution. This green distribution will have also have some free-floating numerical values, and changing those values allow, allows us to morph its shape. And we want to morph its shape to, in a way such that it aligns with this white distribution. The term that we use to do this is called the cross entropy. And the cross entropy is defined as a negative log of Q of X, and the Q, Q is this new distribution that we've just defined. What's nice about the cross entropy is that it means that we don't have to evaluate on the complex distribution, we only want to be able to sample from it. And sampling is just a matter of picking them out from a data set. And we have to be able to evaluate our simpler distribution, which we can do. So this, this, this can work, this is tractable. And one way to define this green uh, distribution in a differentiable way is a normal distribution, which, is, which works. On the other hand, we have distortion. Distortion is uh, a bit simpler to grasp. And for distortion, we have PSNR, MSC, SSIM, or implicit density losses. We're all familiar with PSNR and MSC. These are differentiable metrics. Pixel-wise differences, easy to, easy to define, easy to differentiate, and easy to use. SSIM is a visual quality-based metric, also differentiable. Another more interesting area is implicit density losses. Now, these are other machine learning networks that you can use as your distortion metric. And here things start to get interesting, but we won't really touch on those because that's an entire topic by itself. So now we've defined our rate and our distortion in a differentiable way, and we have our architecture all configured to do compression. How do we get all of this to actually learn something that's useful? Um, before we go there, I want to also show you the intuitive meaning of our rate function. And what's happening here is, at the start of training, we're basically going through training at t equals zero to t equal n. At the start of training, our uh, cross entropy is quite large because our green simple distribution is quite far away from our complex white distribution, which essentially means a big file size. But given that this green distribution has learnable parameters, the hope is that we can morph it into this complex white distribution. And this happens through training. So halfway through training, maybe they look closer together and our file size is better. But towards the end, if we do everything right, and these distributions look very close together, we've reached a state of very good compression because we've been able to learn the distribution over the complex set of symbols that we want to encode. And by Shannon's entropy, this gives us the minimum number of bits required. And we're pretty happy with that. Now, putting it all together, this is again another training setup, so t equals zero is like when you start your training and t equals n is towards the end of training. This will take a couple of weeks. Say you have an image of a white circle that you want to um, learn to compress. You'll put that through your encoder, out come the file size. Now here the file size has this white distribution, which is pretty complex, but we have defined a, a simpler distribution. Currently at the start of training, None of these parameters have been adjusted to satisfy our objective, so everything is pretty bad, so the rate is pretty bad now. We put this bitstream through our decoder and get an output image. 
The output image does not represent a white circle yet because we have not our parameters have not had any time to satisfy our distortion metric. But as we go through training, in the middle of training it looks a bit better, but towards the end of training, what we hope is that when these distributions match, the file size will be minimal and the compression will be great. And the output will now start to look like the input because our distortion is also satisfied. So during training, what we're trying to do is change these free floating parameters in our architecture, in our simply defined distribution, in a way such that our distribution learns that of our data and our output uh, learns to mimic our input. Once we've done this, we've satisfied the rate distortion objective and we've got good compression. Let's speak a bit about production. So now that we've trained this amazing codec, which can do incredible compression, how do we utilize this? To do this, we need to go from a training regime to an inference regime. And the difference between a training regime and an inference regime is in inference, we freeze these free floating parameters and we only use what we call a forward pass. So in training, we need to go forward and then we need to update the parameters. So we need to go back. So you kind of have to do this thing twice. In inference, we don't. Another key difference of AI-based codecs is that they execute on neural processing units. Uh, these are broadly available process nodes on edge devices. They are the natural evolution to GPUs. They're essentially very densely packed matrix multiply units with localized memory. And they're very efficient at running machine learning primitives. So AI-based codecs and machine learning and deep renders codecs all execute on these devices. And in production, what we do is we work with hardware vendors to build binaries, so with Apple, Qualcomm, and Intel, uh, we use their SDKs or neural SDKs to build binaries for our codec and their specific devices. Once we've built those binaries, we embed them into the customer's application such that the customer can now call deeprender.encode as opposed to h264.encode and deeprender.decode as opposed to h264.encode. From a user's perspective, they can fetch a bitstream from the internet, use the customer's application, so your fav favorite streaming application, and decode a video, and from their perspective, they just get better video. From a customer's perspective, they now embed the deep render binary as opposed to an existing binary. It's also possible to have the deep render codec on an OS level, so already pre-existing on devices. More concretely on hardware, AI-based codecs uh, to this day and deep render to this day has achieved the following. So the device reach of AI-based codecs are 50% worldwide and 80% in Western markets. The power is less than a watt for 1080p 30fps, which gives you a very long playback time. And the frame rate can be above 60fps uh, for encode and decode. So these are codecs that work very well in production, are efficient uh, and reliable. Now let's look at the features that AI-based codecs afford us that traditional codecs don't. The first one is the transition from hardware to software. Because we're now running on commodity hardware, which is broadly available, we've essentially transitioned codecs from hardware to software. So it goes from a hardware industry to a SaaS-based software industry, which essentially means we'll get faster rollout. So rather than the seven-year rollout windows, we can now do this in two years. We can also update codecs very easily. So just as you can push out software updates, you can now push out codec updates every time there's a failure or every time there's a newer version available that you want to improve performance on. Codecs can now also scale with hardware progress. So the hardware roadmaps of all big manufacturers look, look incredible. AI-based uh, AI processes are, are getting very, very powerful. And uh, AI-based codecs and all the machine learning can leverage that compute for improved efficiency or compression performance. The second point is domain adaption. Because AI-based codecs are learned, we can change what they're learned on. And that essentially allows us additional codec gains. So you can restrict the domain of over which you learn your codec and get some codec gains. So you can have a codec for, say, just football, if you just train it on football data, or for basketball, if you just train it on basketball data. So you can also have a codec by use case. We can also address traditional codec blind spot. You're using it in production where traditional codecs are failing in a particular point 
or not run to your standards, uh, we can fix that because we can learn on samples. And finally, they're also future-proof. So we can deal with 360 video and AR and VR. And AI-based codecs are still improving 30% year on year. As machine learning and AI continue to improve, AI-based codecs can leverage that. Finally, I'd like to show you some cool examples. This is when AI-based compression goes wrong. Not in production, in training. If you, We've been doing a lot of research over the last few years and we get some cool samples out. So this is one of them. It's quite fascinating what it does. And this is when AI-based compression goes right. So if you do your job right, you can essentially get this. So on the right, you have deep render. And on the left, you have AV1. And this is a pretty complex scene and you can see the difference between the quality. The bitrate is equalized roughly to uh, 1,600 kbps. So I'll just, I'll just play that again. Uh, DeepRender has some demos available of AI-based codecs. So we have a online comparison app which can compare quality and we have a decode CLI on Mac which you can execute on your uh, personal devices if you would like to see AI-based codecs work. Uh, if you would like to reach out, please reach out to myself or uh, my co-founder, Cree.